Now, Melissa is very special to my gut feeling. She has been part of uh, our organization right from the beginning. She was in fact my genetic counselor because I am a Lynch syndrome survivor. She's also, as you know, as Katie mentioned earlier, she is on our medical advisory board. Melissa is a senior genetic counselor at the Zane Cohen Center for Digestive Diseases at the Sinai Health System and has been with that center since 1998. She is also an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. Mel Melissa works with families that have a hereditary gastrointestinal cancer syndrome and oversees a research registry uh, collecting information on thousands of patients to better understand the causes, treatment, and prevention of hereditary cancer. And she has a special interest in hereditary stomach cancer. I know that because her and I've had many discussions about that and she was crucial in helping me through my um, genetic journey as well as my gastric cancer journey. Um, she's published several articles on hereditary gastric cancer in Ontario and hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome and the impact, impact sorry, of gastrectomy in individuals with this condition. So I am so um, honored to welcome Melissa Aronson. First, let me thank Teresa and Katie for inviting me and Michael and Stephanie and Raman and everyone who has made the virtual um, platform possible. It's fantastic. And I'm. Uh, it's very hard to follow Abby. That was a fantastic, fantastic talk. Uh, you should be incredibly proud of yourself and I'm very um, happy to have heard it. So I want to talk a little bit about genetics and hereditary uh, stomach cancer. And um, I want to start with this sentence, which is that all cancer is genetic, but few cancers are hereditary. So what exactly does that mean? Because that's an important concept to understand. So this is a picture of DNA, which are the smallest particles um, of genetics that make us who we are. And we have these DNA packaged into smaller components called genes. And we have genes in our DNA that tell our cells to stop growing. And they're very important genes because we don't want our cells to grow out of control because if they do, that is what cancer is. It's just our normal cells that uh, something went wrong in the genes and they start growing out of control. And that happens if you develop or acquire a mutation along one of these, what we call tumor suppressor genes, and the, the cell no longer has the instructions to stop growing and it starts growing out of control. So if you were to look at someone with cancer and look at their genetics or their genes inside their tumor, they're going to have mutations because all cancer has genetic mutations. The difference between that and a hereditary condition is, is is the genetic mutation occurring in all of the cells of the body? And you don't just have one mutation in your cancer, often you have multiple, but what we look for is, is there a primary mutation in all the cells of the body that made you more susceptible to getting cancer from birth, from the start? And usually if someone has a hereditary condition, they've inherited it from their parents and they can pass it down to their children. So this is something that runs in the family. And there are certain features that we can look for to see if a family might be hereditary or if they just have a sporadic cancer or what we call non-hereditary. So what we look for is that there are mutations in, in the hereditary family in all the cells of their body. They're born with a genetic problem that makes them more susceptible to getting cancer. And it's not 100% they will develop cancer, but they're more susceptible. And this is a mutation, a genetic mutation they inherit from their parents. And that's different from a sporadic cancer where the gene mutations are isolated just to the cancer cells. They're not found in other cells of the body and it can't be passed down in the family. The features that a hereditary family would have is that we would see a younger age of diagnosis, usually before age 50. We see multiple generations in the family affected because it's passed down. And we might also see the person developing more than one type of cancer in their lifetime. Where sporadic cancers usually occur in people at older ages, they don't usually have a strong family history and they don't usually have multiple primary or new cancers. I'm gonna introduce another theme and this is personalized medicine, sometimes also called precision medicine. And what personalized medicine is, is when you um, take the DNA or the genetic material out of the tumor 
and you examine it and you look for mutations along the DNA or the genes in the tumor. And often, as I said, there's multiple mutations that occur in cancer. And the goal is to see, are there any medications that might be able to target the mutation specifically for the cancer? Are there any medications that can fight that cancer specifically based on the genetic material? Sometimes the mutation in the tumor is sporadic, meaning not hereditary. And an example would be HER2 or HER2 new gene. And a medication that might be able to fight a tumor with a HER2 mutation is Herceptin. And sometimes the mutation is hereditary, like in Lynch syndrome, where you have a mutation that you've inherited. And one type of medication or treatment that might um, do well with someone who has Lynch syndrome is immunotherapy. And I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later, but this is what genetics inside of a cancer can sometimes tell us about treatment. So are all stomach cancers hereditary? The answer is no. So in fact, most stomach cancers are not hereditary. You're not born with a predisposition to getting cancer. You develop it because of environmental risk and aging. Um, and about 90% of stomach cancer um, is not hereditary. So about 10% of stomach cancer would be hereditary. So that's a myth that all cancer is. What about all stomach cancers diagnosed at young ages? Are they all hereditary? And, the, and this is also a myth. So in fact, as um, Abby mentioned in her talk, a lot of people with early onset stomach cancer, we can't find the genetic cause of the cancer. And it's a little unclear whether it's because there isn't a genetic cause and it's because of environmental factors, or if it's because we haven't discovered all of the genes yet that explain stomach cancer. What we do know is that early stomach cancer is on the rise. So. These are, this is a graph, and I hate showing too, too much scientific literature, but uh, this is a paper from uh, the US in 2019. And what it shows on uh, the left side is that the early onset gastric cancer, which I think they defined as under 60, uh, was on the decline until about 1993. And then it started to slowly rise again. And it's unclear why that's happening. Where on the right side of the screen, that's late onset gastric cancer. And there's been a steady decline in the rates of late onset gastric cancer um, over the last few decades. So why is early gastric cancer on the rise? There's a lot of research going into that and we're not entirely sure. But over 30% of the stomach cancers or gastric cancers in the US are under age 60. And what we know about them is there are more diffuse type of stomach cancer. And I'll tell you a little bit more about diffuse type stomach cancer in a minute. The cancers seem to be more proximal, meaning a little bit higher up in the stomach. And it's more common in men. And if you take a really close look at the genes inside the cancer, genetically, they look different with different mutations if you compare them to people with the older onset gastric cancer. So another important factor is that not all stomach cancers are the same. It's almost like if someone tells me they have stomach cancer in the family, it's like apples and oranges to me. I need a little bit more specifics to figure out the genetics. So what does that mean? Well, there are some stomach cancers that arise from the lining of the stomach, and we call those cancers adenocarcinomas. And there are some cancers that arise from the blood vessels, and we call those lymphomas, and there are sarcomas in the stomach, and so forth. So depending on the cell type, the type of cancer would change. There are microscopic differences, meaning if you look under a microscope, we can sometimes see features that describe that a cancer is a diffuse type stomach cancer, or an intestinal type stomach cancer. These are both adeno adenocarcinomas, but there are different kinds of adenocarcinomas. And if you look at the genetic level, some of these cancers have mutations in certain genes, like TP53, and some do not. So not all cancers are equal. So let's talk a little bit about the syndromes that cause hereditary stomach cancer. There are many of them. These are just a, some of that I've listed for you, and the bold, uh, names are the different genes that are associated, but there are only a few whose primary cancer is stomach cancer. And this includes the diffuse type of uh, stomach cancer syndrome called hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. And there's another syndrome called gastric polyposis or GAPS. All the other genetic conditions that you see on the screen do cause some stomach cancer, but that's not the primary feature of the syndrome. And so we're gonna talk a little about about some of these different conditions. 
Hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome is the most common hereditary stomach cancer syndrome that we know about. It causes diffuse type stomach cancer. So what is diffuse type stomach cancer? It's a kind of an adenocarcinoma. And this cancer tends to grow under the lining of the stomach. So if you were to look for it through regular screening by putting a scope down the mouth, um, you might not actually see the cancer because it's growing underneath the lining. And it has some different names. Sometimes it's called lightenitis plastica. Sometimes it's called signet ring cell carcinoma based on the types of cells we see. But this is the kind of stomach cancer we see in people with CDH1 mutations. This is a picture of one of our cells. We're looking at some of the chromosomes inside and along our chromosomes are our genes. And if you have this syndrome, you're born with a mutation in this one gene called CDH1. There is a, a sister gene called CTNNA1 and uh, it's a much more rare gene, but it causes the same condition. And this gene produces a protein that we call the e-cadherin protein. So if you have hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, you inherited one of these mutations from one of your parents and there's a 50 50 chance that you could pass it down to your children or that your siblings might have it as well what does the cdh1 gene do it makes a protein that's supposed to tell the cell that there are neighboring cells nearby and it says don't grow anymore or you're going to infringe on our neighbors you have to stop growing so if the CDH1 genes are not working in the cell, the cell has no warning system that there are neighbors nearby and it will start growing out of control and cause diffuse gastric cancer. So diffuse gastric cancer is one of the main cancers we see in people with a CDH1 mutation. The risks have changed over the years. We used to quote a risk of about 60 to 80% that people would develop this kind of stomach cancer if you were born with this mutation. But now we quote risks a little bit lower at 30 or 40%. But I would say it's a little bit dependent on your family history. So the more gastric cancer you have in your family history, probably the higher risk for you yourself to develop stomach cancer if they were caused by CDH1. And the other cancer that we see in these families is breast cancer, this specific kind of breast cancer called lobular breast cancer. There's no other strong links to other cancers. There's some debate about colon cancer, but we don't really see a lot of that. And there is um, a link to a malformation of the lip and the palate that we call cleft lip and palate. So if anyone has cleft lip and palate and stomach cancer, we might think of CDH1. And what we know is that Originally, in my day long ago, when families came to the genetic clinic, they had, they had stomach cancer. That's what brought them to us. And so we only knew of CDH1 families that had a lot of stomach cancer. And what we're learning is that there are families, of course, with CDH1 that have stomach cancer and breast cancer, but there are also families that just have breast cancer and no history of stomach cancer. And now we're finding there are families that have other kinds of cancer. There's no breast or stomach cancer in their families. And they're being tested, you know, maybe someone with ovarian cancer comes into a clinic and gets a panel of genes tested, including CDH1, and comes back with a mutation. So there's now, we're learning various different kinds of families with CDH1. How likely is it we'll find a CDH1 family, uh, CDH1 mutation in a family? This is just a little study that we did, uh, and it was published in 2020 at our group. And if you could see in the orange circle, the DGC, which is diffuse gastric cancer, anybody who came in with just diffuse gastric cancer diagnosed under age 40 and no other family history, we had 18 people in that category, and we found no mutations in any of them. So again, it's unclear why they developed their cancer. Is there a missing gene we haven't discovered? Or is there an environmental factor we're not aware of? Um, if we take a look at people who have at least two gastric cancers, and at least one of them is under 40, this is the interlocking circle, the chance we'll find CDH1 mutation is about 25%. And the greatest chance that we'll identify CDH1 mutation in a family is if someone presents to us with breast cancer and stomach cancer, at least two stomach cancers, at a young age, and then there's almost a 40% chance we'll pick up a mutation. So a lot of it depends on the family history. And if someone like Abigail came to me and said, I'm at a young age, um, I would say there's probably a very small chance we're gonna find a mutation unless you have some other family history, because that's what we're seeing so far. 
Um, how do we screen for diffuse gastric cancer in these families that seem to have a very high risk of developing diffuse gastric cancer? Well, as I mentioned, a straight gastroscopy probably won't find the cancer. So that's not a very useful tool. What we sometimes recommend is that people do that upper scope, but they have random biopsies all around the stomach in a protocol that's called the Cambridge Protocol. We do at least 30 biopsies and Dr. South Brar at Mount Sinai and Dr. Nan Govindarajan at our hospital do this screening, this high risk screening for our patients. And they just do random biopsies in the hopes they might find something. But you know, it's sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. So it's not a very good screening tool. And there are other, you know, methods at the, N at the NIH, they recommend doing 80 random biopsies, but even still, I mean, there are risks with doing all of these things and it, it's really like looking for a needle in a haystack. So screening is not all that effective at finding diffuse gastric cancer. Just to give you an idea, if we were to take families with a CDH1 mutation who had stomach cancer in their family, the chance that we would find a microscopic uh, diffuse gastric cancer, or what we call signet ring cell cancer, if we scope these patients, about 18% of people uh, were found to have this microscopic signet ring carcinoma in random biopsy. But when they later went on to have their stomachs removed because they really wanted to prevent the cancer, almost 90% of them, we found microscopic cancer. And it, actually, this wasn't my study, this is in New York, but um, in our group in Toronto, our numbers are probably a little bit higher than that. And the thought is, if you have a uh, history of stomach cancer in your family and you have a CDH1 mutation, 100% of people probably have these microscopic signet ring cancers in their stomach. The question is, will they ever, can they lie dormant or will they become invasive stomach cancer? What triggers these little microscopic sites to become invasive cancer that is hard to treat? And the, the answer is we don't know. We don't know if they could just stay like that forever and we don't know what triggers them to move on to become more invasive cancers. But generally when we see them we recommend surgery. In the families that didn't have any stomach cancer in the family, you could see there's the numbers are very small. There were only six people in this study but 22 percent of them found uh, cancer on random biopsy, and after they had their stomachs removed, 67% were found to have microscopic cancer. So the, the message of this study is even if you don't have a history of stomach cancer, if you have a CDH1 mutation, you likely carry these signet ring cell carcinomas and are at higher risk for stomach cancer. So what we recommend to people who have this syndrome is that they should consider having prophylactic total gastrectomy, meaning they should have surgery to remove their stomach as a healthy person to prevent the diffuse gastric cancer since we don't know how to screen for it. And when you find it, it's often at an advanced stage. And this is a very hard decision for people. Um, and so we have a whole team at our hospital at Mount Sinai that works with people uh, to try and help them through this decision. Um, and just to give you some idea of what we recommend, this has also changed just recently actually, but if you have a history of stomach cancer, we recommend the surgery to be considered. We also recommend breast screening. If you have just lobular breast cancer running in your family, we recommend the, the stomach screening and you can consider the surgery. The chances are you probably do have a higher risk of stomach cancer. And of course we consider breast screening like mammograms and MRIs. And if you have a different kind of stomach cancer, like a sarcoma or you know, no history of stomach or breast, we recommend the stomach screening. And if you come back with a signet ring cell on a random biopsy, we recommend surgery. And we also recommend doing mammograms and MRIs. So we're tailoring our recommendations a little bit more to the family history. The problem is you might have had someone in your family with stomach cancer that didn't tell you or you didn't know about. And so sometimes family history is not always the most accurate. If someone looks high risk and we can't find a CDH1 mutation, then sometimes we do recommend the Cambridge protocol screening. And we do that at our hospital through a high risk program. Um, in 2020, just recently, the paper was updated to say who we should be testing for CDH1. I'm not gonna go through all this, but I certainly can provide um, my gut feeling with the paper. It's an excellent paper that goes through all of CDH1, the surgery, the screening and so forth. And uh, you can look at it at your leisure. So moving on from CDH1, let's talk about some syndromes that cause lots of polyps. So um, 
This is a stomach that was removed from someone with a syndrome called GAPS. And what you would notice here, and hopefully this isn't too hard to look at, is that this person has lots and lots of polyps in their stomach. This isn't a smooth lining. This is polyposis or hundreds of polyps. And so this syndrome called gastric adenocarcinoma and proximal polyposis of the stomach which is why we call it GAPS, causes uh, stomach cancer, which is what adenocarcinoma is. And the proximal polyposis means that their polyps grow near to the um, top part of the stomach in the body and the fundus of the stomach. So it's caused by mutations in a gene that we call APC. If you have a mutation in this gene, um, in this promoter region, which is associated with GAPS, there's a 50-50 chance that you can pass it down to your children because it is inherited. You develop these funda gland polyps in your stomach. And just a note about a funda gland polyp, these are common in the stomach. A lot of people have them. They're associated with taking gastric reflux medication, which we call PPI or protein pump inhibitors. So having a funda gland polyp in your stomach, not a concern, but if you have hundreds of them, bigger concern that maybe you have a condition called GAPS, especially if you're not on PPI. And if you don't remove the stomach, we worry that they're at high risk for stomach cancer. There may also be an association with colon polyps because this gene, APC, is associated with another syndrome that we call FAP. And people with FAP um, can get hundreds and thousands of polyps in their colon. That's the primary presenting feature of FAP, which also gets mutations in the APC gene. And they do have a slight risk for stomach cancer, but not quite as high. And there are other syndromes that primarily present with colon polyps, like juvenile polyposis syndrome, boots jaeger syndrome. And you can see there is an increased risk, 20% risk for stomach cancer with JPS, 30% risk for stomach cancer with Putz Jaeger, but that's usually not the thing that triggers us to think about these families. It's normally the polyps in the colon. And sometimes there are other features. For example, Putz Jaeger syndrome, people with Putz Jaeger syndrome often get uh, freckling inside their the inside of their mouth or on their cheeks or even on their fingertips or toes. And so sometimes that's the feature that brings them into our clinic. And then once we diagnose Putz Jaeger syndrome, we recommend doing upper scopes. Uh, they tend, they can get diffuse gastric cancer or the intestinal type. Um, so we do often gastroscopies to look for their stomach cancer. And now let's go to Lynch syndrome. I know Teresa, uh, who invites me, um, has disclosed she had Lynch syndrome, so I can mention that it's an important syndrome that we talk about in our in our clinic. And Lynch syndrome can increase your risk for stomach cancer as well, although it's not the primary cancer we see. So Lynch syndrome, again, if we look at one of our cells and our chromosomes, these are copies of some of the genes, the five genes that we know are associated with Lynch syndrome. And if you have Lynch syndrome, you're born with a mutation in one copy of one of these genes. And depending which gene it is, it will determine what the risk of cancer is. Now, these genes are called our mismatch repair genes. And the mismatch repair genes were the molecule of the year in 1994, which relatively speaking, it's not that long ago that they were all discovered. Actually, EPCAM wasn't discovered until 2006. So really, um, this is an older syndrome as we know about it. It wasn't discovered just last year, which some of our other conditions are. Um, but it's still a relatively new condition and we're still learning about it. These mismatch repair genes, their job is to go through our cells, which are kind of like a puzzle, and they look for mismatches in our puzzle. And if they see any, they fix them. If our mismatch repair genes are not working, then you get all these um, abnormal mismatches in your puzzle. It acquires into mutations, a lot of mutations, and it can cause cancer in a cell. So Lynch syndrome is caused by a mutation in one copy of one of those genes. And stomach cancer is more associated with mutations in the MSH2 gene. So there are five genes altogether. The highest risk of stomach cancer is in our MSH2 genes. It's also more common in people from certain geographical areas like Japan, where um, stomach cancer is just naturally at a higher risk. It's also a little bit more common in men. The more common cancers we see in Lynch syndrome are colorectal cancer and cancer of the uterus in women. But there is a one to 15% chance of developing stomach cancer if you have Lynch syndrome. And once again, if you have this condition, there's a 50-50 chance that you could pass it down to your children. That's to pass on the predisposition um, of Lynch syndrome. It's not to pass on cancer, and it's certainly not a 100% chance that you'll develop cancer. 
One of the reasons I really want to talk about Lynch syndrome is because of the reaction of the immune system in cancer. So if we look at this, this is one cell in our body, and this is, let's say, an immune cell in our body, a T cell. Our immune system knows it should not be attacking our normal cells. That's a bad idea for our immune system to attack normal cells. And if that happens, for example, if someone has ulcerative colitis, it means that your immune system thinks that your colon cells are not your own and it starts attacking them and you get inflammation in your bowel. So it actually can cause disease if your immune system is hyperactive. But it doesn't normally attack our normal looking cells and cancer is just our normal cells that are dividing out of control. So an immune cell would look at that and go, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Even though we know it's cancer, it will look at it and say, I don't see anything wrong. I'm not going to attack that. The difference in Lynch syndrome is we go from a normal cell that acquires a lot of mutations and as it starts to become cancer, the cancer cells look different to our immune system and our immune system will attack it because it recognizes that's not a normal cell. And the reason the cells don't look normal is because they have so many mutations in them because it's caused by a mismatch repair problem that our immune system can recognize it. Just about every cancer with Lynch syndrome will have this high mutation burden. Sometimes we call that an MSI high tumor. And so immunotherapy uh, or people with Lynch syndrome who develop cancers that are MSI high, they seem to have a better response to immunotherapy. Um, and there are, let's say in stomach cancer, 1% of stomach cancer is related to Lynch syndrome, but 20% of stomach cancers could have this MSI feature because just in the tumor itself, sporadic problems went awry with our mismatch repair genes. So you could be born with a mutation in your MSH2 gene, or you could develop an, a mutation in your MSH2 gene just in the tumor itself, which is not Lynch syndrome, but it would cause this feature. And so if you look at a tumor, any stomach cancer that has this MSI feature, you might think that immunotherapy would be beneficial because the immune system can recognize their tumors and fight their tumors as opposed to chemotherapy, which will kill your immune system and destroy those cells. The problem, as Abigail mentioned, is this is only in clinical trials right now. And so um, you have to meet the criteria, which often means you've tried a treatment, it didn't work, and now you're at a second treatment. So um, it would be something to talk about the oncologist with, but I just wanted to give you a very simple overview about in immunotherapy um, because it relates to Lynch syndrome specifically. And the last little conditions I'll mention, there's a hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome. You may have heard of it when Angelina Jolie came out saying she had a mutation in her BRCA gene. It's caused by mutations in the BRCA1 or 2 gene. And it primarily causes breast and ovarian cancer running through a family. This is a picture of a family tree. Um, and it doesn't usually link to stomach cancer, but we have seen BRCA2 mutations in quite a few of our stomach cancer families as has, this has been reported in the literature. So when someone comes to us now that wants to have testing for stomach cancer, BRCA1 and 2 is always included in the genes that we test for because it could be that responsible for their, their cancer. This is just a family from um, an article, but what it shows is somebody had stomach cancer at 21 years old who had a BRCA2 mutation. And in fact, we have a family uh, where someone really young with stomach cancer um, has, we believe it was because of BRCA2. There's also a syndrome called Lee-Fraumini syndrome, which is incredibly rare. Um, it causes usually childhood cancers like bone and brain cancers, but I mention it because it's associated with a gene called TP53. TP53 is mutated in about 90% of our cancers, somatically, not hereditary, but it's a very, very important gene for our cell growth. If you're born with a mutation from birth in all of your TP53 genes, that causes Lee Fraumini syndrome. And it generally increases the risk for lots of cancers. But just having a mutation in your TP53 gene in a tumor does not mean you have this condition because it was probably developed as the cancer was growing. So just to my final two slides, just to go for, through some common questions for me. Number one, how are patients referred to genetics? Um, usually they're referred by their doctor because they were diagnosed at a young age, usually under 50, but they have some family history. They might have cleft lip or palate, um, or they might have multiple primary cancers themselves. Even still, what I find is that the diagnosis of stomach cancer is so overwhelming that the last thing people think about are genetics. And unfortunately, 
if people pass away from their cancer before getting genetic testing, when their family members come to us and say, now I want genetic testing, there's often nothing we can do because we have no blood sample for genetic testing. And they'll say, but you know, my relative gave so much blood during treatment and during their workup, can't you use that blood? And the answer is no, because it wasn't preserved to save the genetic material. So just before the pandemic, what we started doing at Mount Sinai and at um, Princess Margaret is we gave um, records or forms, requisitions to all the oncologists and surgeons who treat gastric cancer patients and said, just give it to them. They can have their blood drawn. They don't have to come to genetics get their blood drawn as part of their workup. And if anything is found, we can call and talk to them about it. But at least the blood sample is drawn and done and we are making it easier for them. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't caught on too, too much because the pandemic occurred and it's only being done at really our hospital in Toronto. But this is what I hope to see because we wanna make it as easy as possible for people at higher risk um, to get genetic testing. Why does genetic testing begin on someone with gastric cancer? The answer is because, as I mentioned, our testing just isn't good enough to identify hereditary stomach cancer in a lot of people. So it's not really a yes or no answer. Um, and if someone has a normal result, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have a hereditary condition. It could just mean that we can't identify the genetic cause. And so if your genetic result was normal five years ago, should you be retested? Absolutely, because there are new genes discovered all the time. In fact, next year, there'll be a new panel in Ontario that has the CTNNA1 gene, which um, we don't test for right now. So it's constantly being evaluated. If you're unaffected, can you still have genetic testing? Well, the answer is it's complicated because if your family member with stomach cancer was tested, and we couldn't identify the genetic cause of their cancer, then your test is gonna come back normal and that's not at all reassuring. So really we wanna test the person who's most likely to have stomach cancer in the family. However, if you have a very strong, overwhelming family history and people have passed away and we can't get any blood from them, we do sometimes consider it. Um, so the technical message is most stomach cancer is not hereditary. The flags for hereditary syndromes are early onset, like under 50, multiple cancers, multiple people in the family affected with stomach cancer or breast cancer or colon polyps. Um, there are a few syndromes that cause stomach cancer as the primary cancer, and there are others that can explain stomach cancer, but it's not the primary cancer. And the majority or many, many of our high-risk looking families, uh, we can't find the genetic cause. So there's still a lot of work to do in genetics. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, every time you have this talk for us, I, I feel like I learned something new. Um, and uh, actually, one thing I wanted to point out here. So Melissa was my genetic, genetic counselor back in 2011 when I was 21 years old. Uh, so the indication for me to get tested was uh, because I was so young. Uh, they couldn't find anything genetically wrong with me uh, at that time, uh, but what she did was uh, encourage me to get retested five years later. Uh, and the reason she did that actually is because uh, genetics, uh, the study of genetics comes such a long way. In just a year, there's so many new uh, genes discovered uh, every day that may, uh, may contribute to stomach cancer. Uh, as Melissa pointed out, uh, you know, hereditary cancers aren't uh, the big percent of stomach cancer, uh, but it is a, an important group because of the prophylactic nature of gastrectomies uh, and early detection and early prevention. So thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing that.